Uh, welcome uh, to, I think, the third panel uh, of this conference on ideas and think tanks and foreign policy. First, uh, I'm Richard Eichenberg from the Political Science Department here at Tufts. I teach foreign policy, public opinion, international relations. I'd like to thank Dan for inviting me to take part in the conference, drawing me out of my sabbatical lair. Uh, I'm going to give very brief introductions uh, to our speakers. Uh, full biographies are in your program, and they will then proceed in the order on the program. Uh, they'll each speak from 10 uh, to 12 minutes. Uh, at that point, I will have a one-minute warning. They'll get those 60 seconds, uh, and then uh, the bouncers will arrive. Uh, in the order on the program, first of all, let me introduce my friend Jim Lindsay, who's a senior vice president at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, long time no see, Jim. Uh, also, Justin Logan, uh, the director of foreign policy studies uh, at the Cato Institute. On my right, Danielle Pletka, who's also a vice president of foreign and defense policy studies at the American Enterprise Institute. And Professor Steve Walt, who is the Robert and Renee Belfer Professor of International Affairs at the Kennedy School at Harvard. Uh, as I said, uh, they will each speak uh, for 10 to 12 minutes. They have a series of prepared questions, uh, and then we'll open it up for what hopefully will be uh, an interesting exchange. So uh, with that said, uh, I'll turn it over to Jim Lindsay. Thank you very much, Ike. It is a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me uh, congratulate Dan Dresner uh, on this conference. I put together a conference or two in my lifetime. I know everything that goes into it. Uh, and the people on the panel don't necessarily appreciate it, so let me just say thank you. Uh, and also for Caleb, who I don't know if he's still in the room, uh, putting together the conference while apparently having an injured wing is uh, above and beyond uh, the call. See if he questions me again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm glad you're asserting yourself. Uh, as uh, the last set of panelists uh, noted, uh, a lot of ground has been covered, uh, and I'm probably going to cover some of the same ground here. But in the spirit of the saying, not everything's been said, or everything has been said, but not everyone has said it, uh, I am going to uh, proceed. Uh, let me begin first off by declaring myself a big fan of think tanks. Uh, uh, I've been in love with them since I first went to the Brookings Institution uh, to work on my dissertation. Uh, I'm proud to be in a room with people who work at uh, uh, think tanks. I think they do a terrific amount of very good work. And I think think tanks uh, do five very important things very well. Uh, first is they provide analysis, uh, rigorous policy relevant analysis that isn't done uh, elsewhere. Two, convening. Uh, the ability of bringing together people who have different ideas together or bringing people who have ideas and people who turn those ideas into policy is I think one of the major uh, virtues of think tanks. Uh, third is informing. Uh, fellows at think tanks spend an awful lot of time talking to journalists, reporters, going on radio, going on TV, helping people understand what's in the news. I think that provides a valuable service uh, to the country as a whole. They also spend a fair amount of time going overseas explaining America uh, to non-Americans, and I can tell you having done it a number of times as some sometimes a very complicated exercise uh, to audiences that are not necessarily uh, open to what you have to say. Uh, fourth, and increasingly I would say educating. Uh, the work produced by think tanks is increasingly used in colleges and universities uh, around the country. Many think tanks actually devote a fair amount of effort preparing materials that can be used in college courses. I once read that uh, some old uh, scholar wrote that most people who make foreign policy are uh, laboring under the dictates of what they learned from some long dead uh, scribbler. Uh, and I think uh, ideas have a very long shelf life, if I could put it that way. And finally, this is mentioned several times this morning, mentoring or incubating uh, young talent. Uh, I've had the pleasure to see a lot of people show up at the various think tanks I've worked at. Uh, sort of uh, fresh-eyed, uh, right out of college, uh, trying to find how to do things, and then subsequently see them become college professors or become policy makers, even in a couple of cases, uh, run for elected office. So that's what I see the value of think tanks. Now on to the conference questions. 
I guess the, the title of the session is Have Think Tanks Constrained the Foreign Policy Debate? Uh, and here I will be uncharacteristically brief and say no. Uh, and certainly not to, as the uh, question I was given put it, to maintain insider access. Uh, now, at the risk of being ungracious, uh, I would suggest that the question's premise misunderstands the nature of modern-day American foreign policy decision-making. The process today is too open, produces too much disagreement, and has too many actors participating in it for anyone to be able to constrain or contain it. Uh, I would actually also ask, who exactly are the insiders? Is it the White House, the executive branch, members of Congress and their staff? Uh, they don't agree on a lot. Uh, as you might gather from uh, watching the evening news. Uh, and indeed, when I asked a uh, staffer at the White House uh, if he felt that uh, think tanks were giving the administration uh, a free ride, his response was, what universe are you in? Uh, I think we have a very, very vibrant uh, public debate that goes on, and think tanks don't set the terms of those dates, uh, the, the, of the debate. Now, I wish it were otherwise. Obviously, when you're at a think tank, uh, you would like to have more rather than less influence uh, over what's being talked about uh, in what's being done. Uh, but to a great extent, what is being debated is set by events in the broader political process. Uh, moreover, I would say that when you look at think tanks and look at the evolution of think tanks uh, over the last three decades, uh, the trend that stands out to me is the growing breadth uh, of topics and perspectives. I mean, if you were to take the Brookings that I uh, was a, a graduate student at in 1986 and compare it to the Brookings today, Brookings simply covers many, many, many more topics uh, than it ever did. Uh, and it reflects the growing complexity of the foreign policy agenda and the growing interconnectedness uh, of foreign and domestic events. Now, as to the question of whether uh, funding constrains the output of think tanks, here I can only speak for CFR. Uh, and I would say, in a trivial sense, the answer is yes. Uh, funding is needed to do your work. If you have bigger budgets, you can do more things. You can hire more people. Uh, you can tackle more topics. Uh, but beyond that, I haven't found funding to be a constraint, certainly not on an intellectual level. Uh, the philosophy we follow at the Council on Foreign Relations is that we decide what it is that we want to work on, uh, and then we find ways uh, to fund it. Now, I'll say the brilliance of, the brilliance of American philanthropy uh, is that there are many individuals, many foundations, who are willing to help you conduct that research. Uh, and many of those names are known to you, the Ford Foundation, MacArthur, Carnegie. But there are a whole slew of smaller foundations uh, that uh, aren't everybody's uh, tips of everybody's tongues, but uh, make it possible for people to do work. And what is really interesting is that what those foundations are interested in at the end of the day is one thing, excellence. They want to see you do high quality work on the issues uh, that they care about. Now, as for the question, do think tanks have blind spots? Well, certainly, individual think tanks do. No think tank can cover every topic uh, that might be of interest in foreign policy, let alone every perspective, uh, just as no university can really cover every major uh, or every possible degree. Uh, but collectively, uh, I don't see the think tank universe in the United States as having a blind spot. I think actually what's remarkable about the United States compared to everywhere else, we saw this in the previous session, is just how large, vibrant, loud, cacophonous, uh, <coughs> enthusiastic, energetic uh, the think tank uh, community is in the United States. Uh, Jim McGann, who does uh, yeoman's work tracking think tanks, your number is, I guess, nearly 7,000 around the world, 1,800 in the United States. Uh, I didn't have this tool available when I was an undergraduate, but I went on Wikipedia to see what number they gave, uh, and they gave 98, uh, at least big foundations, uh, big think tanks in uh, Washington, D.C. 
uh, they cover a lot of different uh, parts of the intellectual terrain, AEI, Heritage, Cato, CFR, Brookings, Carnegie, the Peterson Institute, CSIS, Center for Development, for Global Development. Uh, again, that's an awful lot of intellectual terrain, a lot of different substantive focuses, and uh, certainly uh, coming from very different ideological perspectives. And again, no country uh, can match it, and I think that's uh, a great strength in the United States. Now, that is not to say that uh, everything in, in think tank land is done well or that everything is well. I will say, I, I noted in the last panel there was a discussion about risk aversion and the threat of risk aversion in think tanks. And again, maybe it's uh, my perspective, but I don't see it as a problem. I think what's been remarkable is how uh, unrisk averse think tanks have been. Again, going back to the question of what it is that think tanks cover, how much that has changed uh, from 10, 15, 20 years ago. I think tanks have adapted. They have recognized new problems. They've set up new programs. Uh, and I will tell you, having been on the ground floor of trying to build new programs, it's tough to do. It's one thing to have an idea. Ah, here's a new topic I'd like to do something on. But again, you've got to figure out what it is you want to do. Who are you going to hire? What if the person you want to hire doesn't want to come? Who's, your, who's the other person you're going to go after? Then you've got to get people moved. You've got to get them coached up. I mean, it takes time. And I think, again, uh, think tanks have been uh, quite willing uh, to address new issues. I'll just go through some of the ones that I think of the Council on Foreign Relations you wouldn't have done 15 years ago. Uh, my colleague Isabel Coleman uh, created uh, the first Women in Foreign Policy program at a major think tank. Uh, we launched in 2003 a global health program, hired Lori Garrett, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. Uh, what was her big thing? Infectious diseases. Uh, by the way, we urge you to follow Lori uh, in light of what's happening uh, in Africa and elsewhere because of Ebola. We since moved uh, to supplement our work into global health governance with my colleague Yen Jung Huang, and we uh, also do a lot of work on non communicable diseases, NCDs, with my colleague uh, Tom Boyke. Uh, another big focus we've had recently has been on women and girls' education. Uh, again, Isabel Coleman, Gail Lamont, uh, Rachel Vogelstein. We did a recent uh, major project on child marriage. And I can guarantee you 20 years ago no one would have thought of child marriage as either an economic issue uh, or a foreign policy issue. Immigration, the work my colleague Ted uh, Alden has been doing uh, for more than a decade. Countering violent extremism, uh, my colleague Ed Hussein. Uh, in sort of the uh, economic or domestic underpinnings of American national security with our Renewing America initiative uh, that my colleague Ted Alden uh, heads up and partly was responsible for a major report we did on the relevance of America's sagging educational performance uh, in its overall national security interests. And I could, I speak about CFR because that's what I know best, but I know of each of the uh, institutions represented here and in the audience, a lot of new work has been done. So what do I worry about? I worry about two things. One is that we ask the, I'll call modern senior fellow, to do an awful lot of stuff. I remember when I first went back, or first went to Brookings in the 1980s, I thought being a Brookings senior fellow was the best job in the world, right? Fellows would come in, they would spend some time in their offices, I guess, writing, I don't know, I was, I was a graduate student avoiding doing my dissertation. Uh, they would come down for lunch. Uh, they would spend a fair amount of time talking. With, they were some of the greatest conversations uh, you could ever imagine. And they would go back up, and around 4 or 5 o'clock, they would, I guess, wander off. Uh, and they would come back, and every two or three years, they would turn into a book, a really good book. Uh, but that world in which you sort of focused on the fellow as a solitary scholar who sort of writes things, has given way to a world in which you are that solitary scholar who's responsible for generating new, innovative, and potentially influential intellectual content, con uh, content. but you're also expected uh, to interview a journalist, to go on TV, uh, to write grant reports. Think about how to turn what you're writing into digital visualization. By the way, I want you to blog oh, could you tweet while you're at it? Uh, I also want you to travel. I want you to talk to people. And so, quite honestly, if you were to uh, talk to the 
uh, fellows at CFR, I think what they would say is, yes, it's a, it's a bold new world out there, and it's hard to do all of those things and do them all well. Uh, and just as sort of a challenge, uh, and again, because so many more people uh, are in it. Uh, the second thing I would say is, uh, in terms of a challenge, is how do you adapt to what is a rapidly changing communications environment? Both in terms of how ideas are communicated. I mean, we didn't have Twitter 10 years ago. Uh, but Twitter now is a way in which people share ideas, build constituencies, track what's happening. Um, but also, uh, we operate in a much more polarized space, uh, where people have the ability to tune you out if they don't believe you as presenting their preconceived or pre-desired uh, point of view. Uh, and likewise, I keep uh, talking to people in the media business who tell me people don't want to read anymore where they certainly don't want to read anything longer than a couple paragraphs. How do you adapt uh, to that world? If you're about ideas and communicating ideas and you have an audience that at the end of the day wants everything packaged in short, tidy bits, how, how do you actually inform, educate, uh, and uh, enrich the public debate? And I'll stop there. Great. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, our next speaker is Justin Logan from the Cato Institute. Great. Thanks very much to all of you <clears throat> for being here. Uh, thanks to Dan Dresner for organizing this, Professor Eichenberg for moderating, uh, and to Caleb and Aaron for getting us here and squiring us around town. Um, so I wanted to focus on a couple of the questions that are tantalizingly posed uh, in, in the uh, program. Have think tanks constrained the foreign policy debate? And do think tanks have any blind spots? So the remarks I'll give today are excerpted from uh, a paper I'm doing with a colleague that's limited to grand strategy. So that's a, a, a BSIR term that uh, sort of <laughs> consumes uh, the, the sort of broad strokes of American foreign policy. So I want to be clear that I'm not talking about this or that particular narrow tactical issue. Um, and as you'll see, I think that there is a lot of debate. Uh, it just isn't uh, uh, very useful. So my answers to the questions to foreshadow are no, think tanks have not constrained the foreign policy debate. Uh, I, I agree very much with the remarks that think tanks don't have that sort of independent agency. Uh, but the think tanks do have an important blind spot, and that is th the idea of grand strategy debate. There is no grand strategy debate in political world in Washington. And I think this is a puzzle because there is a grand strategy debate in the academy. It's a very vibrant debate. Um, and as three people who recently wrote in defense of the status quo grand strategy, the majority of academics writing about U.S. grand strategy think it's deeply flawed. And we're not having a debate in Washington. So this difference between what's going on in the academy and what's going on in Washington is the puzzle that animated uh, the paper. And just also by way of throat clearing before I get into the rest of the presentation, there's been much made about the Keynes quote about uh, being enthralled to some long dead scribbler. It's interesting that John Stuart Mill, uh, really in some ways the intellectual architect of the concept of a marketplace of ideas, uh, wrote that rarely does a good cause triumph lest someone's interest is bound up with it. So I think that's a useful sort of counterpoise to the Keynes thing that we ideas people like to think that ideas have a lot of independent agency. Uh, but Mill, who was an ideas guy, realized uh, money matters too. So this, I gave a version of this talk. I went, I did a master's degree at a school that's not policy focused and kind of hates policy. Um, and so, but a lot of those people want to work at think tanks for some reason that still mystifies me. And so they said, well, let's bring Logan here. He works at a think tank and he can talk to them about think tanks. And I gave them more or less the, the talk that I'm going to give today. Um, and I explained that the, the skills that people learn in academic political science not only make them less useful to think tanks, but make them less inclined to want to work at think tanks. And so I gave chapter and verse on this, and oddly enough, I wasn't invited back to talk to the students. So I think the question you have to ask about do think tanks constrain the foreign policy debate is what does politics want from political science? Right? We're not out there telling this or that policymaker, you guys are going to have to go after ISIS in this way, or you guys are going to have to expand the defense budget in this way. We're, respond we're the agent, <coughs> not the principal. Right? So we have to suck up to power. So the question becomes, what does power want from us? 
And what I think politics, what power wants from political science or from analysis of politics, is number one, it wants the veneer of scholarly credibility to cover their own pre-existing preferences, whatever those may be. You can be a Marxist and say they're getting money and they want to protect their money. What they want is the idea that scholars say that what we're doing here is important. So I, I have no, you can have whatever your view of why policymakers want to do what they want to do, but what they want from political science or from think tanks is the premise that science says what we're doing is correct. And the second thing that they want to do, and this is where, this is the substance, this is the good, happy story about how think tanks can influence public policy, is they want advice how better to implement existing policies or previously existing desiderata in the policy community. So that's the environment in which we work, whether or not we're aware of it. Um, that's what I think politics wants from political science. And for people who like this idea or don't like this idea but want to argue with it, there's a good essay by Hans Morgenthau called The Purpose of Political Science, which juxtaposes two ideas of political science, the sort of goo-goo, hippie, truth-to-power stuff that I like that doesn't work, and on the other hand, the sort of sucking up to power stuff that actually does work. Um, and I say sucking up to power, it's not always conscious, right? People are sort of shaped by the constraints in which the, under which they operate. But it's this idea, and I think what the problem with the way think tanks operate is they create the appearance of debate. We scream at each other all the time, right? There's all this arguing, you've got the red box and the blue box on TV, and, the rah, you know, and then they're going at each other. And there's the appearance of debate. We have this premise that we're engaged in a substantive debate about America and the world, what should we do, the isolationists are coming, you're an imperialist, da 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 da. But there isn't a substantive debate about American grand strategy. And what all the cacophony of all the 1,800 institutions shouting at each other does is create the appearance of a substantive debate. And that's where I think think tanks are to blame, not so much that we have somehow the power to constrain the debate ourselves. So what do think tanks want, right? Why are think tanks in this sort of getting whipped all the time by politics position? Why are we involved in this interaction at all? Well, what think tanks are after is policy relevance, right? And this is a loaded term that people uh, bandy about um, and talk about a great deal, and I think it's worth unpacking a little bit, right? Policy relevance. What's relevant to policy? What's relevant to policymakers? So think about, zoom out from this sort of fuselage of cynicism I've been hitting you with, and think about sort of a more goo-goo policy process, right? How, how does public policy get made? Right? God, you're in the Pentagon, you're thinking about these things, what do you do? Think about a syllogism, right? Given the nature of the world and the way the world works, if we value X, then we should pursue policies that look like Y, right? Given if then. Given the way the world works, if we want to do X, then we should do Y. If we value X, then we should do Y. What policymakers generally don't want and generally don't think are policy relevant are number one, generalizable claims about the way the world works. Right? So Alexander George had this great quote about the minute you use the word theory, policymakers' eyes glaze over and they just, uh, they can't, uh, theory, what are you talking about? And that theory is about how the world works, right? Uh, under what sorts of circumstances do sanctions tend to work? Does nuclear compellence work? Um, all of these sorts of broad strokes IR questions are not of interest to policymakers. Um, by way of background, I was somehow got corralled into moderating a um, closed door thing with uh, an academic publisher. And the publisher was doing the normal garment rending about how do we get people in Washington to read our stuff, and it has footnotes and sometimes Greek letters and coefficients, and everybody freaks out, you know, how do we do this? And so I, again, back in my old earnest days, had this idea, well, maybe what you guys could do is take the footnotes and the Greek letters and the jargon and the coefficients out and just write, like, prose that explains what you found um, and send out a sort of foreign affairs type article um, to policymakers or to staffs of policymakers, and Jim, I apologize for what the response was, gales of laughter. Because the idea of a foreign affairs piece uh, being digestible, not by an elected official, but by the leader of uh, uh, an office, was sort of risible. And I, 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 I want to believe that this was an exceptional response, but it's, I mean, there were some bold-faced names in the room, and I was just appalled. You know, I thought it was pretty cynical going into the thing. Uh, and I came out more cynical. So policymakers don't like this stuff. Uh, and even, I think, International Security is a journal that does a good job of 
boiling down and dumbing down its journal articles to like 3,000 words, which is you know pretty long foreign affairs article. Um, and I wonder the extent to which those get into policymakers' skulls. So I think policymakers generally don't want the sorts of stuff that political science produces, even what I would call, and I hope other people would call, policy relevant, whether it's right or wrong. And what they also don't want is information about how the way in which the world works should influence their policy preferences, right? Given that nuclear compellence does, doesn't work, you shouldn't even try to do this. They think they've got that covered. And it's striking, I think, that even a really smart academic who got poisoned by living in Washington for a while, um, Stephen Krasner, was writing a piece about bridging the gap between political science and policy. We're all bridging the gap, dance. I think the first Fletcher ideas was bridging the gap, and everybody's, you know, blaming the academy about this. But Krasner wrote that, you know, one of the reasons that policymakers don't listen to academic political scientists is because, quote, even the most convincing empirical findings may be of no practical use because they do not include factors that policymakers can manipulate. Well, think about that for a second. Is it, wh why does it follow that because something doesn't include factors that policymakers can manipulate, it's not of practical use? There are all sorts of things that engineers can't manipulate, but they're very, very essential to the principles of engineering. You wouldn't want your guy building a bridge to be like, wow, well, whatever, we'll just do it the way we want to do it. So that may be overdrawing the analogy between engineering and political science, but it's very bizarre that we have somebody saying it's not useful because it doesn't include things I can manipulate. What policymakers want and what they tend to mean by policy relevance is advice how to better market and at best how to better implement their existing policies. And there's just a terrific quote from a British guy, of course, because it's a terrific quote, uh, who was consulted on Afghanistan policy but did not agree with the surge decision on which he was consulted. And so he was explaining this experience to a journalist, and he said, it's like they're coming and saying to you, I'm going to drive my car off a cliff. Should I or should I not wear a seatbelt? And you say, I don't think you should drive your car off a cliff at all. And they say, no, 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 that bit's already been decided. The question is whether to wear a seatbelt. And you say, I, I guess you might as well wear a seatbelt. And then they go out and say, we've consulted with policy expert Rory Stewart, and he says that we should wear the seatbelt driving off of the cliff. And that's the idea, right? That's how politics views political science, right? This is the Morgenthau cynical idea uh, about how political science gets used. Think tanks in the policy community more generally are welcome to help provide rationales for existing policy, operational advice on how to implement the policy, but there's no incentive for scholars to openly criticize U.S. grant strategy. Two quick points to close on this subject. There's an excellent history of the RAND Corporation's involvement in Vietnam. RAND's working in Vietnam in the early 1960s and in the mid-1960s, and they're writing a series of reports that strongly imply, by way of inference, that the policy is completely screwed up and bound to fail, right? The Air Force, the White House, everybody is very infuriated by these things, even though their inference is not direct uh, uh, statements. So what happens over a period of time is Rand gets rid of the pessimists, brings in uh, optimists who say not only that the policy is working, but that what the policy needs is more air power, which it just happens to be the case that Rand's primary funder of this research was the United States Air Force, oddly enough. One final point in closing, the most thoroughgoing investigation of the Bush, George W. Bush administration's decision to invade Iraq cannot pin down a debate among cabinet officials or a decision point to invade Iraq. There is no record, Don Rumsfeld, George Tenet, etc., of a debate, even within a small cabal of inner circle advisors. Guys, what do you think about this? Are we on the right? There's no evidence that that took place. And so I think if it didn't take place in the halls of power in the White House, uh, it's easier to explain why it's not happening uh, in think tanks. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Uh, and now, uh, Danielle Pletka from AEI. Putting my timer on, and I, it will immediately fade out, so you're going to have to interrupt <laughs> me. Okay, start. Um, 
it, it's so hard to follow you. You're so entertaining. Uh, uh, <laughs> I was going to do interpretive dance. I know, it, no, and, and you sh you should do interpretive dance Thanks. because it would it would add it would add sure. enormously. Um, uh, thank you, all the thank yous, and uh, I'll dispense with the usual. I'm repeating what everybody else has said because it will become patently obvious that I am in fact repeating what everybody else has said. Um, we're all at think tanks, so uh, invariably we tend to repeat uh, what the other one says. As Justin just pointed out to you, it'll come as no surprise to you that I actually disagree with Justin, who weirdly appeals to authority from a lot of dead people, um, a claim that he makes about the rest of us. And I actually uh, am rather fond of policymakers, but that is because I am that sort of think tank slut person that likes Washington policy and really likes influencing it and actually enjoys discussions about grand strategy, but recognizes that the track record of academics, Stephen Krasner notwithstanding in government, has been really craptastic. Um, but over to, uh, we can fight about this at lunch, which would be really fun, especially if there's wine. Damn, Caleb. Um, the best, uh, let me just sort of dispense with the questions, just as everybody has, uh, and then go on to do exactly what Justin recommended, which is talk about what I want to talk about. Um, so, uh, the best role for think tanks, I can't read my own handwriting, the best role for think tanks in the marketplace of foreign policy ideas, you know, I, I think that the best role is, is in fact to be in the marketplace of ideas, it is to have a competition of ideas. Perhaps one of the sins that we don't talk about often enough is the sin that we see in this room, which is I believe I'm the only conservative here. Uh, am I? Want to raise your hands? Anybody else? Anyone? Conservative? Republican? Nothing? Oh, conservative? Uh, I, I'm, Dan? A I'm a real conservative. <laughs> yes. There's another word for you. Um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, and that perhaps is, is, is the most unfortunate thing about think tanks is that, is that we don't see that sort of, uh, you know, that, that interdisciplinary work. And, and I'll tell you a little sort of vignette. We're, we're running a project um, called the American Internationalism Project. And if you had any idea how uh, difficult it is to name a project like this, uh, because you go through and, in fact, Hillary has a PAC called American Internationalism something, and somebody else has an organization called this, that so we eventually came up with this rather lame name for a for a, a quiet project that and we brought in pretty much you know a whole bunch of people different think tanks in town um, uh, and in fact Cato came and talked to us Justin came and talked to us which was enormously useful and it was basically meant to be a, a conversation among internationalists not about grand strategy but about whether internationalism was in fact a fading idea whether there was support for it in the United States why, why support was fading and we brought in lots of different people and we had you know uh, the Open Society Institute George Soros, we had AEI, we had Heritage, we had Brookings, we had CNAS, uh, which is uh, where Michelle Flournoy comes from, uh, CSIS, a whole bunch of think tanks. The problem was that when time came, and, and we have really sort of dramatic agreement about a whole series of issues across bipartisan lines, um, but when it came time to sit down and try and write something together uh, on issues that we agreed about, there were all these constraints. And one of the things that I like about AEI is that I, uh, I am not constrained. I actually can sit down and write something with somebody paid by George Soros, and, and no one is going to say anything to me. The same is not true on the other side. And I, I don't generalize. I think there are plenty of places where it is possible. But in fact, it has become very difficult for people to do things in a bipartisan way unless they are, in fact, um, doing it sort of on a you know very namby-pamby kind of a, you know, yes, motherhood and apple pie are really good. So that's a, a big missing element. And uh, and so perhaps the marketplace is a little bit, uh, is a little bit uh, uh, cabalized, if you want to use that word, which is um, then, do mainstream think tanks constrain foreign policy thinking to maintain access? Yeah, I agree with everybody else. I mean, yes, up to a point. Uh, the more doctrinaire the think tank is, and I think we can probably figure out who they are, the more difficult it is for them to say things that are critical of a particular administration. Not so much for fear of losing access, but for fear actually of losing money. Uh, their donors tend to be the same donors that brought a particular administration into power, and uh, it's hard for a very doctrinaire conservative think tank to say, wow, you know, Harriet Myers, George Bush's nominee, 
uh, what was she nominee for? Something. Supreme Court, uh, Supreme Court is an idiot, uh, despite the fact that there was a broad consensus in Washington that indeed she was. Um, and so some conservatives didn't say that. We were not among them. Um, ditto, uh, it is hard for some very democratic left-leaning think tanks to say bad things about the Obama administration. Um, I don't think that it is a question of access. I think it is much more a question of donors. And their donors get very mad at them when they say bad things about the administration that we all work to bring into office. That's a left-right problem. There's no one to pick up. Does funding impose constraints on outputs? Oh, sure it does. Anybody who tells you it doesn't is lying. Absolutely, it is, uh, it is something that is a growing problem. Um, there are a lucky few for whom it does not pose constraints. Um, I'm among them. I know that many of my colleagues in the room uh, are uh, among those who aren't constrained, but there are plenty who are, in a both a negative way and a positive way. So, um, you know, uh, some companies don't want us to talk about the Exim Bank and say that it's a waste of money, a particular issue that was, uh, that was uh, hot in Washington over the last month. And, um, sorry, I'm looking for my timer here. And, um, uh, they pulled funding. Uh, one of the big supporters of XM and beneficiaries of XM pulled funding from organizations that criticized uh, the XM Bank. Uh, yes, that means a lot to people who need to raise money, and most of us need to raise money. One thing I'll say about foundations, and uh, Jim, you talked about foundations. Let me tell you, I've never received a penny from the Ford Foundation or the MacArthur Foundation or any of the foundations that you talk about because they give exclusively to Democrats. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, certainly in the foreign policy arena, literally never a penny. Now, I'm willing to bet you probably haven't gotten a penny from SCAFE, but maybe you have. Um, in any case, those are sort of well-known issues. Blind spots in the think tank world, yeah, I mean, there are blind spots in the think tank world, but most of them are based on uh, our inability to find people who are capable in this rather complex world that all my colleagues have talked about and can actually tweet and write a book and go on TV and uh, speak to an audience. Uh, that that magical person is very hard to find in all, all areas. I um, would love to do more work in certain areas, and I haven't found anybody who I thought would be really good. And uh, that's just a reality, and I think it's a reality that can constrains pretty much everybody. They're not so much blind spots as they are difficulties of finding people who do good work in, in particular areas. I, I think that's true in government as well as everything else. Um, just a few last things before I run out of time. Um, before I run out of time. So um, somebody mentioned young people, and I think that that is a, a huge issue. Um, think tanks used to be the preserves of dusty old men who wrote books and came in occasionally and hung their coat and their hat on their back door and didn't do a whole hell of a lot of anything and, and hoped that some PhD student, D student would ultimately read their book. Um, it, it's nice. I like it when young people come to think tanks. I don't think they're crazy um, at all. I think that it, in fact, makes them better thinkers, um, but only if you don't treat them like you know people who get you coffee and and, and Xeroxers, and that, that's always a, a challenge. We have literally thousands of, of young people who, who come through AEI every year, and I wish we could do better. More and more think tanks are getting into the business of education. They do courses, they do, um, their scholars participate in courses, and I think those are all to the good as well because they challenge scholars not to be sort of <coughs> dusty and boring and not policy relevant. Um, money. You know, damn, it is hard to raise money. And I think it's important to underscore that this is a real challenge to everybody, even, even institutions, venerable institutions like Brookings and CFR that have larger endowments than smaller places like AEI or, or Cato. We raise money every single year. And uh, it, it, is, uh, it is sort of a, a, an exercise that is fraught with peril. Because when people give money to institutions, they tend to want things in return. And saying no is hard. I had somebody give us money for a, a series of, of conversations about defense spending, and they didn't like it. And I'm lucky. I was able to turn around and say, you know what? Go away. Uh, take your money back. Here it is. Because uh, I'm not going to do it the way you want me to do it. 
but plenty of people are not able to do that. And so you see events in Washington like Kazakhstan, light of the future or economic opportunity? <laughs> and you think I'm kidding. Uh, this is this is how you end up in thrall to, to, to people and to foreign countries and to foreign governments that give you money. Um, the growing problem of the C3, C4, um, Michelle talked about this this morning, but we don't talk about it enough. The growing problem of, of, of institutions like all of ours, which are 501C3s, we are um, non-profits uh, uh, under tax law, and we start C4s, political action committees, um, that uh, don't take tax-deductible donations, and they're commingled. Okay, Heritage Foundation has one, absolutely, but so does the Center for American Progress. And let me tell you, when I went to the Center for American Progress's homepage in 2008, and I saw the Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld lie counter, okay, I thought to myself, hmm, I wonder what scholarship underpinned that because it was on their home page. Now, I think that everybody slips into this sort of partisan exercise every now and again, but increasingly what we see is that the C4 dominates the C3, and I think this is a really dangerous trend for a lot of think tanks, whether on the right or the left, and I know that the people within the C3s that are at the heart of these institutions hate the fact that they have to be associated with these C4s who end up alienating a lot of the people with whom they'd really like to work, whether it's politicians or it's other think tanks or it's, uh, or it's it, other institutions or companies. It is extraordinarily difficult. So there's one last thing I wanted to say, but I, maybe I can bring it up in the Q&A rather than go over my time. It's up to you. Thank uh, you so much go. for bringing your own timing device. <laughs> uh, okay, batting cleanup, uh, originally from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, <laughs> Steve Wall. Um, Jim Lindsay characterized himself as a fan of think tanks. I think my role here is to be less of a fan. Uh, but I should say that as someone whose first professional paycheck was from the Center for Naval Analyses, I spent a year at the Carnegie Endowment, a year at the Brookings Institution. I am an active member of the Council on Foreign Relations. And when I lived in Chicago, I was an active member of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. So I've worked in this world uh, as well. Uh, the topic, do, uh, do think tanks constrain debate? I think the answer to that question depends on how you interpret the question. With a few notable exceptions, I think the main think tanks do not actively work to shut down debate, censor discussion, enforce some kind of ideological agenda. There are a few cases where analysts have lost their jobs because they strayed outside the mainstream. Uh, there are a few cases when speakers have been disinvited by mainstream think tanks because the leaders decided that they were too controversial. Well, on the whole, I don't think Richard Haas, Strobe Talbot, Anne-Marie Slaughter, Arthur Brooks, and Michelle Flournoy are actively colluding to enforce orthodoxy and limit debate. The problem, rather, is that the most important and influential think tanks merely reflect the dominant consensus within that foreign policy establishment as a whole. They don't actually have to do very much to constrain debate because there's not that much disagreement within that community in the first place. And only a few people have to lose their jobs in order to remind everybody pretty much where the lines of consensus are drawn, what you're not supposed to say. Now, whether you think that is a bad thing depends a lot on whether or not you think American foreign policy is doing well these days or not. I think it's mostly been a failure for the past two decades, which is why I think one can be increasingly skeptical or at least questioning of the role that think tanks have played. And that's the basic argument I want to lay out. Now, let me uh, briefly outline why I think that's the case, starting with the, what I see as the main features of the contemporary think tank world. First, as has already been said, these are not pure research organizations whose purpose is to produce scholarship of lasting value. Rather, the goal, in addition, uh, is to gain access, to influence policy, and not surprisingly, to advance the careers of people at the think tanks. These are not, uh, uh, these are not unworthy goals. Um, because many people in the think tank world rotate in and out of government, and because high-profile ex-officials help raise money, help keep the think tank in the public eye, those organizations inevitably tend to reflect the worldview behind recent policy decisions and recent policies. If a lot of your senior fellows used to be in government, they are unlikely to come 
out to the think tank and spend all their time criticizing the things that they did when they were in power. Uh, true, I think, of both parties. Uh, second, uh, Michelle highlighted this well, and I think Danielle just did too quite well. Uh, these are organizations increasingly dependent on soft money of various kinds, which means their agendas are going to be shaped either directly or indirectly by donor objectives. If you get lots of money from Lockheed Martin or Chaim Sabin or the MacArthur Foundation, you can't simply ignore their preferences over time. It's not just foreign sources, it's also domestic sources that have a particular agenda as well. Now, to say that is not to say that think tank analysts are just laptops for hire working for the highest bidder, but they're not purely independent sources of analysis either. Let's not be naive about this. Their agendas are going to reflect the prevailing sources of power and influence in society at large. Third, the organizations and the people who work for them are not very accountable. Right? Giving good analysis or advice isn't really essential. What matters is whether you represent the positions that the leadership of the organization and those donors are willing to support. Being consistently wrong does not disqualify you from lengthy employment at mainstream think tanks, provided your political views are consistent with what that organization's leadership wants. Just to give you one noteworthy example, Neoconservatives in America are probably the most consistently and catastrophically wrong group in the history of U.S. foreign policy, yet a surprising number of them have found semi-permanent sinecures at a variety, not just one, at a variety of D.C. think tanks, including the Council on Foreign Relations, AEI, the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, Brookings, Carnegie Endowment, etc. Hardly any professional consequences have flown from their uh, mistaken policy advice. And that brings me to the main point here. There actually isn't a wide range of disagreement in the contemporary foreign policy community. Analysts at most of these major think tanks are strongly committed to American internationalism, strongly committed to what some have called a grand strategy. I think John Eikenberry coined this phrase of liberal hegemony. There are disagreements about specific tactics, certainly specific policy decisions, but all of them tend to favor American global leadership, see America's global role as indispensable, believe the United States should strive to maintain its current position of primacy, should actively promote democracy, actively prevent the spread of weapons of mass destruction, including the use of American military force if necessary. Hardly any of these people question the value of NATO expansion. Almost all of them, even when they favor diplomacy towards Iran, want to keep all options on the table for dealing with it. All of them openly support our special relationship with Israel, the pivot to Asia, etc. Now, Zenia this morning said that one of the advantages in think tanks is that think tank people can talk uh, to anyone without consequences. They are freer to do that, they say, than government officials. But that's not even necessarily true. For example, some of you may remember in, back in 2007, 2008, Rob Malley lost his job as an advisor to the Obama campaign when it was discovered that in the context of his role working for a think tank, the International Crisis Group, he had actually met with representatives of Hamas as part of a think tank, not in a government job as well. And Obama quite prudently ditched him from the campaign. So just more evidence of, of this consensus. Uh, the major think tanks in Washington, not institutionally, but the major fellows in them, uh, consistently supported the Iraq War in 2003. Very hard to find people at prominent think tanks uh, who opposed it. And that includes groups like the Progressive Policy Institute, uh, many people at Brookings as well. This was not true, by the way, in academia. Um, liberal Democrats, uh, card-carrying liberal Democrats like Evo Dalder will co-author op-eds with someone like uh, Robert Kagan, which again, not a bad thing, but it tells you a lot about the range of opinion uh, we have here. Um, I think Bob Kagan's own career rather illustrates this as well, from the project on New American Century to the Carnegie Endowment and now to the Brookings Institution where he's becoming best friends with Hillary Clinton. Leading figures at supposedly liberal think tanks like the Center for American Progress, and here I'm thinking of Brian Katulis writing an article last year against disengagement, again opposing any uh, 
step away from uh, vigorous uh, American and global activism. In fact, it's, it's so uh, interesting now that when someone like the Council on Foreign Relations employs a scholar like Micah Zenko, who is actually often questioning of some of that consensus, it's so unusual people actually write profiles about how <laughs> odd it is that they have someone like that. And just uh, one final snarky uh, comment, uh, I did a column for Foreign Policy earlier this year uh, where I compared the annual conferences of the Council on Foreign Relations, the New America Foundation, and the Center for New American Security. And if you looked at the speakers and the topics, it was a set of largely interchangeable parts. In fact, what was most striking is that John McCain was a keynote speaker at two out of three. Um, which, again, uh, not to criticize Senator McCain, just suggests there isn't a wide range of choice here. Again, there are sometimes tactical different differences, but very few think tanks are openly questioning of these broad premises. The one exception is, of course, where Justin works, uh, the Cato Institute, and a bunch of small little left-wing think tanks that hardly anybody pays any attention to have much uh, less weight. What this means is that just as there is an imbalance of power between the United States and just about everybody else in the world, there's an imbalance of power inside Washington between groups who consistently support American global activism and groups that might favor somewhat greater restraint, a somewhat more selective use of American power around the world. All right, let me just note two caveats and then I'll stop. First, in criticizing contemporary think tanks, I am not suggesting that university-based scholars are inherently superior or that some of these pressures don't operate in our world as well. The ivory tower has its own set of pathologies. Uh, we make our own set of moral compromises. So I'm not standing here saying that you know, we're much better or anything like that. I would also argue that within academia, the closer you get to the world of policy, at schools of public affairs like Fletcher, like the Kennedy School where I work, the more that you see these same pressures for conformity start to arise. Right? So that we're not immune from these uh, at all. Um, second, I am not suggesting that people who work at think tanks are a bunch of venal, evil people who get up each morning looking for some way to screw the country and advance their own careers. I think they genuinely believe in what they are doing, they are responding to a set of incentives that rewards certain beliefs and behaviors, but not others. I'm not even suggesting that every element in that foreign policy consensus I described is necessarily wrong. That's a separate debate one could have. It's just that the range of disagreement is not very broad. Now, lastly, whether this consensus is a bad situation or not depends a lot on what you think about recent American foreign policy. If you think American foreign policy has gone really, really well over the past 20 years, that the Clinton, Bush, and Obama foreign policies have left the United States substantially more secure and more prosperous, if you believe that, then foreign policy think tanks should get up, take a bow, and claim a lot of the credit. If you think American foreign policy has screwed up repeatedly under both Democratic and Republican presidents, then the think tank community that has supplied the ideas and many of the people helped justify those policies needs to shoulder its share of the blame. So a lot of this does ultimately depend on how you think American foreign policy has performed. Or as we used to say back when I was a teenager, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Think tanks, in my view, are not the main reason why foreign policy debates are so constrained in the United States, but I'd argue they aren't doing very much to widen it either. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's four very stimulating uh, sets of comments. Uh, I actually expect hands, expected hands to shoot up. I think uh, they're in shock. Uh, I'll open the floor. Yes, uh, Professor Dresner. Nope. Oh, there there we go. Go. First of all, thank you. This is exactly what I wanted. <laughs> um, let me push Steve a little bit um, on this question of, of incentives, because you can argue, in some ways it ties to Danielle's point, which is the role of money in all of this. So if it's the case that part of the issue is that think tanks to be able to do what they do need, their, you know, need the money, and the money has a certain set of foreign policy preferences, then how do you propose to create alternative institutions that would potentially do the kind of innovating that everyone's talked about, you know, so far, 
but in terms of sort of outside the box foreign policy ideas, is it that, for lack of a better way of putting it, and I don't want to mean to sound like a Marxist here, but is it that the money advocates a certain form of, of foreign policy that is at variance with the preferences that you might potentially prefer? Um, I think you are starting to see a little bit of the sort of pendulum swing that you're, you're talking about. Some moneyed interests who are less interested in global activism getting involved in, in a somewhat more active way. But I'd argue this is sort of a familiar story of American politics, that uh, special interest groups of all kinds tend to care more about particular issues, get more engaged in it, and in America there have been more narrow interests in favor of global activism than groups uh, uh, opposed to it. But it's not just money, although I think money is, is critical. Uh, the other part is reputation, right? If you go off to Washington to have a foreign policy career, you have to maintain a reputation you know, for being smart, for being loyal, for not being unreliable, for not thinking too many crazy thoughts. Uh, if you do think crazy thoughts, for not saying them out loud. Uh, understanding that you've got to stay pretty much within a set of boundaries. And you might wander off once or twice by mistake, as long as you wander back in relatively quickly. Because foreign policy careers very much depend on who knows you, who's willing to promote you, who's willing to advance you. And I think that inevitably forces a degree of conformity, a degree of consensus, where people tend to both stay within a certain set of lines, but also tend to also treat each other with a certain amount of deference. Um, you know, Washington is, on the one hand, a very partisan town, but on the other hand, a very, you know, back-slapping, back-scratching town as well. And both of those dynamics are at work. Yes. Could you, uh, at least for my benefit, uh, state your name, please? Uh, Zonia Wicket, Chatham House. I, I also want to pick up a little bit on Steve's point, because I think perhaps you're just a little bit unfair. Um, if you thin it, fit it, sit in the think tank community, I would say, you know, on the panel, take almost any issue and you're going to find actually quite a lot of divergence of opinion on how to deal with the transatlantic relationship or the U.S. pivot or ISIS. Um, I, and I think that, I mean, so I, I think, is there a narrow band? Yeah, there's probably a narrow band of policy, but that's because... Actually, unfortunately, policy is, by very, its very definition, mostly quite constricted. I mean, if you go out of left field, then you're going to set up a whole set of repercussions that you really don't want. So actually, the right, right I say in inverted commas, the right policy answers are in a fairly narrow band, broadly defined. But that is broadly defined. Within that narrow band, there are real divergences. It is rare. I worked Homeland Security post 9-11. It is rare that you have a whole set of policy questions for which there is no path at all. So there are questions being asked that we, that we didn't have a path, be it a Democratic or a Republican, a Conservative or a Liberal path to follow. Um, that is extremely rare where you're actually trying to define the path and create it. But now there is a band. And within that band, I think that there are wildly diverging opinions. So I think you're, I think you're perhaps a, a little unfair. Um, well, as I said, I think there are, there are often disagreements about tactical questions, but rarely about uh, first premises. And the overwhelming instinct, I think, within the foreign policy community is whenever a problem arises, the United States must do something. You see the amount of pressure someone like Obama, who's clearly reluctant to do a lot of things, but he comes under tremendous pressure to show a response, whether it's in Syria or elsewhere. Sometimes that's right. Sometimes an American response is called for. But the option of, of saying, no, this is really somebody else's problem, right? that say dealing with ISIL is not a mortal threat to the United States. It's a mortal threat to the people in the area it controls. It's possibly a mortal threat to some Kurds, maybe even to some Turks, but not to the United States of America. It tends to be an opinion that you can find if you go do a Google search on it. You're just not going to find it very often inside the Beltway. Can, can we other oh yes of course yeah, speak if, if you want to ask them please some do questions. please do I, I appreciate Steve's well and Peter <coughs> Justin as well and uh, Danielle but it seems to me as, as I'm listening to these comments uh, in many ways they character think tanks and senior fellows uh, in ways that are I think unhelpful and distorting uh, just a couple of things. Uh, Number one, there seems to be a premise running throughout here that every senior fellow uh, has the White House personnel office on speed dial uh, 
uh, waiting for their moment to move out. And I will tell you that a fair number of fellows at think tanks around Washington, D.C., uh, on the left or the right, um, aren't looking to go into government. And I think it's important to keep that in mind. They are dedicated analysts. Maybe they come from the journalistic world. Maybe they have PhDs, but they care deeply about the intellectual matters they're pursuing. They write real serious stuff. Number two, uh, I appreciate uh, Justin's point about, and Steve's point, about people not debating the, uh, I guess, the meta question of the direction of American foreign policy, uh, grand strategy, I guess, the way people like to refer to it. Uh, I, I think actually there's a fair number of people trying to compete to win the Kennedy sweepstakes, uh, as we refer to it. But I think the fixation on who's debating or not debating should America be in or out misses the fact there's a lot of foreign policy that is always going to be conducted and carried on that have nothing to do with those issues and that people work really hard. Whether you're talking about people working on development issues, uh, what one should do about promoting human rights abroad, uh, and a whole variety of issues that are worked uh, at great depth. And in part, just to go back to something Zania just said, uh, comes up with the reality that if you are interested in an issue and you're trying to give advice to policymakers, you have to give them things that are actionable and tractionable. You have to have concrete uh, policy recommendations. You can't say, assume an entirely different world. Uh, that is not what you can do. Uh, third thing I will note, when we talk about think tanks, think tanks are not all alike. I noted that uh, Danielle made a strong claim about naivete and immediately walked it back uh, because I think that in, in the think tank universe there are different kinds of think tanks. Uh, and yes, there are think tanks that have the, I never get the alphabet soup correct between the A's and the B's and the C's and the D's, but many of them don't. Uh, and I will note that uh, that uh, Danielle pointed out AEI, she came under pressure from a funder to do the wrong thing, and she didn't. Okay, and I think at certainly the think tanks that are represented in this room, that ethos, that belief in how one conducts oneself uh, matters, and it does drive how decisions are made and how those organizations mm -hmm. conduct themselves. And I know it's easy to laugh at it. I know it's easy to call it naive. I know it's easy to raise uh, questions about people's motives by saying, oh, money must talk. But in fact, there are really people out there who care deeply about the intellectual inquiry they are on. Final point, again, getting back to funding. As I said, I spoke only about my experience at CFR. But I will note there are foundations on the left, there are foundations on the right, there are foundations in the middle. There are a variety of places in which to raise money to do the work you wish to do. Uh, Danielle has a comment So a reaction? Uh, uh, no, 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 a couple of things. Um, first of all, there aren't very many foundations in the middle. Um, I, I hate to say it. You know, but you bring up a very important point uh, about uh, about funding, which is that somehow, and, and I think that the New York Times article that we've all referenced several times um, uh, sort of has, has stirred up this conversation again, which should be had more. Uh, it's better to air these things out. Um, uh, my late boss used to talk, uh, when I worked on Capitol Hill, he used to talk about Henry Kissinger, and he used to talk about all the money that Henry Kissinger got from the People's Republic of China, and it was buying him. And I said, no, it's not. That is where Henry Kissinger is, okay? They may be paying him because they're happy about that, but they were not buying Henry Kissinger, who otherwise would have been a stalwart for the island of Taiwan. Because okay, that's just not how it works. And I think that it's important to understand that, you know, if, if, for example, you know, you believe in markets or if you believe in against regulation or if you believe in sort of robust internationalism, you are going to be attracted to, you know, CFR or AEI or Cato. And, you know, I don't think Justin is being bribed to be hostile to regulatory policy. I think actually he probably came in thinking, you know, we're overregulated. I happen to agree with him, but you know, so it, it is important, and, and I don't think we stand up enough and kind of say those kind of things when people say that money is buying think tanks. That's not fair. Okay. That being said, there is a growing group, and we can still call it a subgroup in Washington 
that is being bought, that is doing the job of foreign agents, that is lobbying, that is under the guise of intellectual analysis and, you know, dinner partying, actually bringing foreigners in to meet with uh, government officials. And this happened under Republicans and Democrats. And it sucks. Okay. And it makes all of us look bad. Okay. And I know who they are. And I'm willing to bet that most of us know who they are. And that is not cool, um, and, and there's not e enough done about that. Um, you mentioned something else. Oh yes, uh, it's sort of uh, the suggestion that 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 um, somehow this revolving door thing is bad. Let me underscore. Uh, I think it's great when people from think tanks go into administrations, whether it's you know left leaning or right leaning. And by the way, Rob Malley is the senior director on the National Security Council, uh, so I don't think that his meeting with Hamas did that After much to harm his career. Term. Well, yes, he did, and Rob's a, a very good friend, and I, I like him very much. But uh, he got that job, so he did okay. There are plenty of people who didn't get those jobs and still haven't gotten them who have other beliefs and are being punished for them. You know, I, I guess that's the way the way of the world. But there's absolutely <coughs> nothing wrong with somebody who engaged in the sort of long-term thinking and medium-term thinking that Michelle talked about this morning, which I think is what everybody is hoping is our sort of our wheelhouse. Yeah. And, uh, a, a, and, you know, we're not uh, under the tyranny of the inbox. And that those people then turn around and take those ideas and go back into government. Now, if it's a constant sort of a circle, then all right, we can start to have a debate. But intrinsically, uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. I, I do want to put my one last comment, my one last minute that I didn't bogart uh, before because I was so disciplined um, out there. And it's something that we actually have talked about a little bit, but we haven't dug into. And this is a really interesting challenge, and you'll all be happy to hear that it has absolutely zero partisan overtones. Um, and that is this question of metrics and influence. Okay, um, When I started in the think tank world in 2002, coming out of government, uh, uh, somebody said there wasn't Twitter. That's absolutely right. Our web page was an embarrassment. It, it was horrible. Um, and, uh, and we didn't know how to count anything. We didn't have a blog. There was absolutely the same debate at AEI that there was at every other think tank that has a blog about whether this is demeaning to us and I will never, ever blog. My scholarship is not going to be debased in that way. I I do not want thousands of people to read my stuff. I like the 15 people that have been reading my stuff for the last 20 years, and damn it, I'm going to stick with them. Yeah, it, we have this conversation all the time. The problem is that there's this really impossible balance for all of us because you, you raise money, people want to know who's seeing your stuff. That means how many visits your website get. That means how many Twitter followers you have. Did you host a debate on Facebook? Oh my God, I hate hosting debates on Facebook. You know, all of these sorts of things that are not, that, and we're not a, a tech organization. None of us are tech organizations. And so we're not great at this stuff. And we have these fuzzy, jerky Google Hangouts occasionally. But you know, this is a really interesting challenge for all of us, and it's something that none of us talk about. Because at a certain point, you do start to value the numbers more than you value the scholarship. And finding that balance is something that actually is would be really interesting for all of us to talk about, because there's no partisan question whatsoever. It is really just about the quality of scholarship, the ability to influence, the ability to take it and slice it and dice it and reduce it to 140 characters. And I know that I fight this fight every single day. And I want people to read our stuff. So it is a very, a very interesting thing that we haven't brought up. Logan, please. Yeah, just uh, real quick. So I wanted to point out one thing that maybe didn't come out in my remarks that's sort of been dangling out there um, in the Q&A, right? So Cato's a weird organization on a lot of levels, Danielle will tell you. Um, but we wear our ideology on our sleeve, right? We're a libertarian group. We hire libertarians. We write libertarian stuff. We're libertarians. I think one of the pernicious things that happens is there are institutions that say we have no ideological commitment whatsoever. We're judicious analysts of facts and data. We merely input and output. Every organization has an ideological position. 
right? It may be, uh, talking about foreign policy, it may be the status quo grand strategy with some marginal tweaks on the right or on the left. But the idea that institutions market themselves, and there's the word nonpartisan, which I think has meaning and is true in many cases, every institution is ideological. It hires people of a particular sort of ideological persuasion, sometimes people of different ideological persuasions than the main uh, 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 valence of the institution. But I think this idea that one can have an institution that is not subject to the whims of ideology is part of this problem and this, this lack of sort of forthrightness in the debate. I wanted to also correct one thing that Jim McGann had said. Uh, there was a think tank that opposed the Iraq war. It was the Cato Institute. Um, it was really a miserable uh, experience uh, for the people who did it. Um, and there was really no upside in the long term. Uh, it was really a totally pointless endeavor in being right. Um, and I wanted to respond to one um, thing that, that, that Jim Lindsay had said. Um, so he talked about, you know, the sort of pressures and policy, you know, maybe it's not so bad as I made it out to be. And I want to read a quote to you from somebody who came to sort of rue his support for the Iraq war. Um, and ascribed his support for the Iraq war to, quote, unfortunate tendencies within the Washington foreign policy community, namely the disposition and incentives to support wars to retain political and professional credibility. That's Leslie Gelb, the former chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations. So I think if the president of CFR feels the, the disposition and incentives to support wars to retain political and professional credibility. Imagine yourself an ABD PhD candidate who's like, you know, I think this grand strategy is screwed up. Les Gelb is an institution, and he felt these uh, pressures and incentives. One final point about uh, debate lack thereof. Abortion, gun control, environmental regulations. There are countervailing interests or identities on both sides of those debates. Right? It's not the case that the anti-abortion people or the pro-environmental regulation people, with some exceptions, have, you know, sort of, again, this sort of Marxist, you know, equation dynamic. People's identities are bound up with thinking of themselves as part of a certain kind of country. And that happens in foreign policy, too. But there's money on both sides of those debates. There's not money on both sides of a grand strategy debate. So there are all sorts of ideas out there. People hold different sorts of ideas, but money only exists in defense of certain sorts of ideas. And so it's not the case that people are like, oh, I'll have the ideas that the money wants, but it's the case that you hear ideas that money likes more than you hear ideas that money doesn't like. Okay, uh, just note quickly that there's some dissent out there. I, I noticed a bumper sticker yesterday that I loved that said, I'm already against the next war. So there's somebody out there questioning the consensus. Yes, sir. Do I really need to use this? Oh, okay. Oh, right. Um, well, Justin, you just raised an issue that I was just going to quickly comment on. I mean, when we talk about whether there's a notable debate within the think tank world, I think you really do have to look back to the original Iraq war and see, I mean, we can all now look back and I think agree that maybe there were some problems that might arise with the Iraq invasion, and virtually no one raised those, those issues back in 2003. I mean, that's pretty astonishing, and anyone who thinks there's a vibrant debate, I think, has to really figure out what went wrong there. Um, I had a couple of specific questions. Danielle Pletka, um, you talked about, uh, you know, these people who are bringing in foreigners um, and they're screwing it up for everybody. Well, not screwing it up, but like they're making everybody look bad, you know, think tanks. So who are they? Who are these people? I wanted to ask. And um, Jim Lindsay, um, and I'm only asking you this directly because you're the one member of the panel who sort of suggested money really wasn't um, an issue. Who pays for your research? I mean, does, does CFR pay? Uh, release its donors, how much they give specifically, and your, you in particular, where does your money come from? Because if this is the thing to me that I always find troubling with think tanks is they just generally fail to disclose this. If there's no problem or no issue, then why not just make it public? It would be very simple. Just put it on the website, and everybody knows, and then it's disclosed. Okay. If I t do you want to tie into that stream of questioning? Otherwise, we'll let the two respond. Yes. I wonder whether people could address the question. It's not that there aren't different opinions out there. It's that those opinions aren't being listened to. And somebody earlier talked about 
actually hearing how do you get your voices heard and I wonder whether actually the challenge isn't that there aren't lots of different opinions on different policies but actually the outliers just aren't being listened to and how do you actually change that? Uh, I think you were addressed first, Danielle. Uh, <coughs> I think they want you to name names. Yeah, I'm not going to. Well, why? Why not? I mean, doesn't that just seem like protecting people? No, I, I want you to use your energy for a productive purpose and do some research. That's why. I hate cheating. Jim? It's like the line with the police department. <coughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Anything further, Jim? On that question or right. the question I was asked? Uh, oh, the question you were asked. Remind me of the question was you asked me, because I also want to respond to Zania's comment. This, this comes, I don't know the answer to this question, but this okay. comes from important relations list its donors and disclose how much they give and who pays for your specific research. Okay, fair enough. Uh, if you go to CFR.org, uh, click on about drop down frequently asked questions, it provides uh, where CFR's money comes from by source. You can also write and get a list of donors. Okay. Uh, my, I own, hold an endowed chair, uh, and CFR is very fortunate. I, I would say in terms of uh, the way things are structured in the Dave Rockefeller Studies program that I head up, about 40% of our costs are covered by endowed chairs. People have over the years given money, those endowments throw off. Much like at a university, Steve's the uh, Belfer uh, professor. Uh, we also raise a very large amount of money from uh, lots of uh, foundations, okay? Uh, we take no money from the United States government. We take no money from foreign governments. I will uh, also note that uh, CFR is different than a lot of think tanks in that uh, we have fellows all across the ideological spectrum. Steve is unhappy with certain fellows we have. Uh, he doesn't like their track record. He likes others at the other end of the spectrum. Uh, so we have people who sort of are all over the map uh, intellectually, ideologically. Uh, I would say, though, and I'll grant Justin this, the people who work at the Council on Foreign Relations are very interested in foreign relations. Uh, no doubt about that. Uh, some of them are uh, positive on the administration's policy. Some aren't. Some like parts of it. Some don't like other parts of it. You get a bunch of CFR senior fellows together, you'll find out they disagree about a lot of stuff. I also want, if, if I may, go back to Zania because I was at Brookings in the run-up to the Gulf War, and I noted the following thing. We would give lots of interviews uh, to journalists, and uh, what I saw sort of personally is if you were critical, uh, generally speaking, what you said would show up at the tail end, uh, col uh, column inch 22, uh, and you were more likely to get featured further up if you were critical of the war if you granted any premise of the administration's case. They would say, even critics like said, uh, what have you. Uh, one of my uh, colleagues at Brookings was uh, a supporter of uh, the Iraq war, and he got an awful lot of press, I think in part because journalists liked the, being able to say even so-and-so at uh, the Brookings Institute, left to center Brookings Institution, uh, said X. And all of his colleagues who thought he was wrong uh, didn't get the same kind of airplay. So there is a problem of, it's not just what you say, it's who reports it, how it gets reported, uh, and if anyone's really in a mood to listen to. And this goes back, if you look at, I think we have a very robust debate in this country uh, about what America should do in the world, certainly uh, judged by the polls. A lot of people are deeply skeptical uh, of what we do in the world. And the ability of think tanks or any think tank fellow to channel direct that conversation uh, is, is very limited. Uh, Logan had a quick interjection, and then I know we have more questions waiting. I just wonder, and Jim, I ask this genuinely, do you think that the range of people writing about strategy at CFR specifically or in think tanks generally is roughly analogous to what people in the academy are writing about American strategy? Is it, does it reflect more or less the same spectrum of opinion, or would you characterize it as being quite different? I wouldn't compare the two because they're involved in very different enterprises. And what's different about the think tank enterprise that makes them so Because in the think tank strategy? enterprise, what you're hoping to do is to marry deep, rigorous analysis mm -hmm. with the ability to generate concrete, tangible policy recommendations. That is, if you were to walk into the president's office or into the member of Congress office and they're asked, what should I do? 
you have an answer to that, that that answer is not simply be more prudent, con uh, conduct a study, uh, make a probability statement, but rather, Mr. President, uh, you should give this speech, you should say X, not Y, you should make this phone call, not that phone call, uh, this is the package to go over to Capitol Hill. And again, at think tanks, you, think tanks, uh, particularly one like CFR, I'd imagine a lot of the other larger think tanks, cover lots of issues. You're not going to have a stable of people uh, pondering about grand strategy. Foreign policy is about making specific decisions. Right here in the second row. I'm Brooke Williams, a journalist. Um, my question is for you, James. Um, I'm wondering, you mentioned that CFR doesn't take money from foreign governments, mm -hmm. and so my first question is why? And then also, um, CFR does take money from foreign-owned, foreign government-owned entities. Um, so Aramco Services Company, which is Saudi Arabia's oil company, and uh, Japan Bank, that's owned by the right. Japanese government. It's New York um, Times so, article, right? This, you're reading from the New York Times article. No, as I'm a actually part. reading. Yeah, reading from oh, okay. My, my okay. Database. Okay. Database. Of, okay. Yeah. Anyway, um, and so I'm just wondering, like, what the difference is. You know, okay. where. Yeah. What What's the difference between a, a the government? First, and a, why? Okay. Why no government? Okay. And then what's the difference? Uh, we do not take governments because what we do is make recommendations for how the U.S. and other governments should do. So, in some sense, we're giving advice to uh, governments and governments themselves are players in that, so that's why we choose not to, okay, number one. Number two, the, the two uh, government entities you referred to are members of CFR's corporate program, okay? okay they don't give, the, the, what you're referring to is what they pay for their membership dues. They do not support any, any research done at CFR. In the back row there. My question uh, picks up on what Jim was just saying, what Steve said earlier, which is this intersection between academe and, and policy. And Steve, you mentioned earlier that the closer an academic gets to policy, uh, the more they're constrained by the same constraints. Uh, at the same time, we also just heard a vision where the academic was pretty far removed from the policy debate. And I guess I'm wondering if maybe you could both comment a little bit on how one gets the incentives right so that the academic who is engaged in the policy debate isn't constrained by uh, exactly the same structural constraints that one faces perhaps in the think tank world, uh, but also then doesn't become irrelevant just pose of proposing a study. Um, you know, where, where do those two pieces speak to each other? Um, I'll say a couple things. One is I don't think there's a, there's a nice sort of magic bullet answer to this problem. I think if you are an academic who wants to get more engaged in the policy world, you're going to run up against the same set of constraints and incentives that someone working at Berkeley or AEI who wants to play that. And, and, the, and it has to do with, do you want to get noticed by policymakers? Do you want to maybe be a policymaker at some point, you know, go in and out? Um, so if you think of the people I have as colleagues uh, immediately at the Kennedy School, you know, Nicholas Burns, Joseph Nye, uh, Graham Allison, a whole series of people who have gone in and out of government at various points, they face certain constraints to cert say certain things, not say other things, because they want to either retain their eligibility or at least retain their access, be listened to. And there are ways in which you can um, make that much more difficult, make policymakers not want to be in the same room, not want it to be known that they had, you had a meeting with such and such a person who wrote that crazy thing uh, or whatever. So I think that you know, it's inevitable. I also think that the money issue that we've been bouncing around is, exists for universities as well. Right? And you can have donors who give money to university and they can be unhappy by things that professors write and deans are sensitive to keeping their donors happy and there's lots of subtleties involved in this. It's not that a dean will come to a faculty member and say, please don't write things like that anymore. You can't, particularly if you have tenure. It's very hard to say that to somebody. But there are lots of subtle ways in which you can encourage people not to do X, not to do Y. And even tenured faculty members, I think, can be susceptible to that. Finally, just uh, to echo a point that's been made here, we should recognize there is wide variation in the think tank world over the level of transparency that they provide. So the council is better than most at laying out who its donors are. It doesn't exactly trace where all the money goes, right? but you at least have a pretty good sense of where they're getting it and in roughly the, the quantities. There are other think tanks that are completely opaque. It's a mystery. I've 
Uh, we should talk later. I've tried to figure out with some of them where are they getting their money and where, where are they spending it, and it's impossible to tell. And maybe that's an issue one could talk about, whether or not a, a, you know, a rating system that tried to give sort of five-star think tanks that were very open, you know, what do they got to hide? And one-star think tanks that never tell you anything about where they get their money or how they spend it, and just so we can be informed consumers, right? Maybe it's that they're just paying for things, nobody's being bought. I would just like to know that. If somebody's getting $150,000 to write X, Y, or Z, I would like that information so I know whether or not to discount what they're saying or not. Just on that score, quickly, I, most of these think tanks represented here, to best of my knowledge, when they produce written reports, identify their funders. 